Good afternoon and welcome to Conversations with Father Bosco, a webinar series hosted by the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's conversation, Walking in Faith with Imam Yaya Hendi. Our host, um, Father Mark Bosco, is Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University and holds an appointment in the Department of English. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Father Bosco joined Georgetown in 2017 after 14 years at Loyola University, Chicago, where he was a tenured faculty member and served as director of the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. As a scholar, Father Bosco has focused much of his work on the intersection of theology and art, specifically the British and American Catholic literary tradition. He has published on a number of authors, including the writers Graham Greene and Flannery O'Connor, and is the co-director and co-producer of the new feature-length documentary on Flannery O'Connor. This award-winning film will have its television premiere on PBS American Masters in March. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of St strategic engagement and alumni relations and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few reminders. This conversation is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel. You will receive the recording link in our follow-up email. Father Bosco and Imam Hendy will answer audience questions towards the end of their discussion. Please send in your questions using the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please also submit those concerns via the question section of your control panel. Without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Father Mark Bosco. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, it's wonderful to be back here in our conversations. And I'm here with our Imam at Georgetown, Yaya Hendi. It's been, uh, this is my fourth year now at Georgetown. And over the four years, I've gotten to, um, to not only watch, uh, Imam in action, but uh, to really call him a brother, uh, especially as we traveled a lot over the last year, which we'll talk about uh, uh, later on in this conversation. But um, Imam Hendi, um, uh, you you were born in Palestine. Where did you go to school? Um, I know you've done some graduate work and stuff. Where, where did you learn to become an Imam before we kind of move into Georgetown? Let's get that out in the open. Yes. I was born in Palestine, and from uh, Palestine, after my high school, I went to the University of Jordan, where I did my religious education and training as uh, as an imam. Ah, oh, very good, very good. So I, I I wanted to become an imam, believe it or not, from the age of twelve. Yeah. Yes. I made earlier on. Wow. Well, you know, you've been a real true pillar of Georgetown's community here. I, this is your 21st year accompanying our Muslim students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Uh, and you really have been one of the great collaborators on Georgetown's interfaith work here on campus in so many ways. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what drew you to the ministry in the first place? At 12 years old, you said this is your vocation. Um, what What do you think, what was, what was it, was it, what, what was it about? By the way, at Georgetown, I don't only accompany uh, and work with Muslim students and faculty and staff. Actually, not only I, every one of our chaplains, we work with and for all of our community members, regardless of faith and uh, uh, background. Uh, you know, I, as you said, I was born in Palestine, uh, growing up with occupation around me, uh, poverty. A lack of understanding the world as connects with the Palestinian Arab conflict and Israeli conflict, wondering about where is the future? What is the future for Palestinians? What is the future for peace in, in, in the Middle East? A question that I found it in religion, a peace and compassion and justice. But not only that, in my village where I was born, in the village of Kifil Harris, I was born about 300 feet from the tomb of Joshua. I was born about 300 feet from the tomb of Jonah. Yeah. I grew up very connected with these biblical figures and religious figures in our traditions. Yeah. That sort of led me to studying about religion and about spirituality, about God. I used to pray in a mosque that was built about 700 years ago. So connecting with history, with religion, with tradition, with spirituality, sort of enhanced 
the interest in religion and the interest of spirituality. And at age 12, the local imam asked me to deliver a sermon. <laughs> so here you have a middle school student asked to deliver a sermon, a major sermon, in a major uh, holiday on a major day. It empowered me, it strengthened me, it encouraged me to see religion as a source of empowerment, a source of spiritual uplifting, but also answering many of the questions I have. Women and where what their role is in society, social justice, and how religion can become relevant to our lives. All of those questions combined is what sort of gave me that direction, guided me. Mm. So I decided when I finish my high school, I'm going to become an imam. And here I am. Very good. I, yeah, it's funny how vocation works because you know most uh, most um, Jesuits in the past would have been coming out out of high school, eighteen to twenty four maybe, and now it's probably a little bit later than that. But there is this sense that it all kind of starts coming together and coalesce as you meet the difficulties of the world, but you're also carving out a place in your heart for God. Um, so uh, I know that I know that you speak so. You speak with such intimacy um, about your love for God. You have also have a great love and respect for Christianity, though, as well, and the Bible. And I remember you showing me your Bible uh, when we were with you in Palestine uh, that was written in Arabic, I think you said. And um, you were just a boy when you received that. Can you speak a little bit about your experience of that, <laughs> and kind of the Christian-Muslim relationships in your own intellectual and professional journey? Yes, I mean, my father... Uh, used to teach in Bethlehem, mm. uh, which is a Christian majority town, you know, the, the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Uh, someone from the local community gifted my father an uh, Arabic version of the Bible. My father later left Bethlehem and started teaching in the city of Nablus, and he took that Bible with him, and it is still in my father's book collections. Yeah, yeah. So earlier on, I think I was again 11 or 10 or 12, around that age, when I saw this book and I opened it, it seemed it looked very old, and I got interested. Wait a minute, this is good. You know, I loved what it says. I loved, I loved the messages, the narratives. And I started connecting between what I used to read in the Quran, my own holy book, and what I read in the Bible, I found so many similarities between the Bible and the Quran. But I also found contrasts and differences, which got me interested in what brings Christians and Muslims together, but what also separates them. Mm. To believe that we have much more in common than we have differences. Yes, there are differences, but those differences do not separate us, do not make us enemies. At the end of the day, we are created by God, regardless of where we pray on Friday or Sunday and how we pray. You know, but the, the many commonalities between biblical narratives and Quranic narratives is what drew me clear, closer to Christianity. After I finished my uh, training as an imam and I came to the U.S. 30 years ago, my friend, 30 years ago. Wow. To enhance my study of Christianity. So I went to a Christian seminary, Hartford, Connecticut, in Connecticut, and lived with the Christians, uh, studied Christianity, took courses on Christian theology, Christian ethics. Gospel Luke became my favorite gospel, Dr. Luke, I mean. <laughs> Writing papers on the Gospel of Luke, Christian ethics, historical uh, criticism theory, how Christians understand themselves. It brought me closer to Christianity and to Christians. Again, to understand that we have much more in common that we need to work on. Our gift for social justice, our love for God, our love for humanity. Yeah. Our, our belief that God is a manifestation of compassion that we have to live in our lives. So this is how my love for, for, for my Christian sisters and brothers started. And after that, I established an organization called the Clergy Beyond Borders. That's what I do when I have nothing to do. <laughs> I, love, I love it. The clergy Beyond Borders. It is a group of a Christian, Jewish, and Muslim clergy who believe that, yes, we have borders between us. However, those borders do not celebrate us. We can celebrate them. 
they do not divide between us. We can celebrate our borders. And I traveled with those Christian ministers and priests and rabbis and imams across the United States of America and across the world saying, yes, we can be together. Yes, we can coordinate. Yes, we love one. And we have to work with one another on what enhances the cause of our human family. So this is sort of my interest in interfaith dialogue and that religious dialogue and how it, 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 it started. That's wonderful, man. Um, you know, I remember you were hired by uh, Father Leo O'Donovan, right, in 1999. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so you were doing all this work uh, with, you know, clergy beyond borders all that. Can you tell us what drew you to want to be at Georgetown in those kind of initial meetings with Father Donovan and his staff? You know, to start with, when I, when I applied for my job, I had very little knowledge about the Jesuits. Ah, oh, interesting. I, I, nothing but the truth, so help me God. But it did not take much time to know the beautiful values of the yeah. Jesuits mm -hmm. uh, and what they are, what they represent. To find out that Jesuit values are very Jesuit and very Catholic and very biblical. Mm -hmm. But those are also Muslim values. Every one of those values that you talk about in Jesuit values is based on the Quran too yeah. and has basis in our theology and our teachings. Enough to say that those values are universal values. Yeah. It, it, and it did not take much time to feel at home in every way, shape and form. Feel I'm a brother, I'm a friend, I'm a colleague, I'm a partner in helping our students to grow spiritually and intellectually as leaders of tomorrow. I remember one of my very first meetings with Father O'Donovan, I said, Father, you only have about 100 some Muslim students in Georgetown. Why would you hire a full-time Imam and pay a full-time salary for only 100 some Muslim students? He said, Imam, I am not hiring you for Muslims alone. I'm also hiring you for the Catholics and the Jews and the Protestants and everyone. Mm. He, the Catholics deserve to know about Islam and should know about Islam. Right. So the Jews and the Protestants and everyone. Imam Hindi, I don't want you only to be the chaplain for Muslims. I want you to be the chaplain for everyone. And that touched my heart. It touched my soul. It is a priest who understands that we are all in this together that ignorance is our worst enemy, that our understanding of one another is the way to move forward, that he wanted me for all, not only for Muslims. It touched my heart in every way, in every shape, in every form. But you know, also, I came, I came to a, a university uh, as the first Muslim chaplain in the history of the country. Yeah. There was no other Muslim chaplain anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. Oh, you're frozen a little bit, Imam. There you go. Georgetown gave me the support to study, to travel, to learn about what it means to be a Muslim chaplain. So I started the program from zero. Yeah. And now we have hundreds of Muslim students. We have Muslim chaplains at so many other universities in the, in the country that people are learning from what we did at Georgetown and how we do it at Georgetown University. I remember you know, a few weeks after I was hired to Georgetown University, uh, I was invited to meet with the president, then Bill Clinton, at the White House. Yeah. President Bill Clinton, an alumni of Georgetown University from the class, exactly. yes, became the first American president to celebrate Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr at the White House. Yeah. Yeah. It happened in coordination between Georgetown Muslim Chaplain and the White House. Yeah. This meeting. Imagine Albright, who was the Secretary of State, she invited me to organize an Iftar Ramadan celebration at the State Department, the beginning yeah. of a tradition in our government institutions, the, engage, the positive engagement with Islam and Muslims. And therefore, my coming into Georgetown, it was not only to serve our students and our faculty at Georgetown. It's rather to serve our city, our capital, and our world, because I started traveling uh, yeah. across the world to build a, a positive relationship between the East and the West. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things I love about Georgetown as uh, in admission history is that we do have these centers, these intellectual centers where we can really do these kind of like thought leaders and think tanks. But we also have the, the chaplain uh, who is a, a, man, a, a man of great prayer, who's also an intellectual himself. You, Brahmachari, Rabbi Rachel, you all have that. But you, you, you infuse, you might say, uh, what we're about at Georgetown so that we're, we're both head and heart, right? And I think that one of the things, Imam, you bring not only to Georgetown students and to uh, our, our, really our whole uh, staff and um, administration and alumni is this sense that um, you are somebody who speaks from the heart of your faith. Um, so I know a lot of I know a lot of people who I even mean, know Jesuits who are Muslim scholars, right? We have we have Jesuits who are Muslim scholars here. Uh, but it's really nice to see this kind of interplay of hand and heart uh, throughout. And I think that that was one of the great, um, really one of the great gifts. That you know, one of the courses uh, that uh, was started in 2000, a year after I arrived, called Interreligious Encounter. And that course that continued for almost 16 years, yeah. taught by a rabbi who is a clergy, but also an academic, uh, a priest, who is also an academic and myself yeah. that started once a year, but it became so popular that the demands of the students required it to be every semester. Yeah. yeah. And in that classroom, we came across very intellectual, very educated, very well informed, but also spiritually oriented. And when you bring the soul and the mind together, you have the real positive leadership yeah. that we want in the world yeah no it's so, it's so true and i do think that georgetown has become really a an example of that for for other universities and things like that you know i want to ask you about um a conversation we had i forgot maybe it was even a conversation we had before we all went to um the holy land last year but you were talking about uh the story of how georgetown responded after the terrible events of 9 11 almost two decades ago. And can you recount the story for our alumni and friends about the prayer service in the Levy Student Center and, and also the invitation that was followed up to go to the White House to talk with President Bush? Uh, in the, I think this, it's really a profound moment again. Um, and, and so glad that you were here. Thank you, Mike. But before I do that, I just want to talk about that the class, the interreligious encounter, because oh. the impact of Georgetown University goes beyond the Healy Gates. Yeah. You know, the College of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey had started teaching that course in the very same way. Fordham University, another Catholic university in New York, also started teaching that course. I know so many colleges across the country that started imitating that in Georgetown University. Our impact goes beyond oh, Healy, yeah. beyond Washington, beyond the United States of America. Yeah. So thank you to the graduates who gave me the honor to be <laughs> a part of this history making in Washington and around the world. And going back to September 11th question, you are right. I mean, I, I was in the midst of it. At that time, I was doing some work with the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, so connected with the US Navy. I was at Georgetown University. My name was already or became known because of my interaction with President Bill Clinton at the White House. And I was called upon by the White House to go to the White House on September 11 uh, to see what can be done. But at the same, before that, I remember driving into Georgetown University that day with tears in my eyes wondering about okay history has changed obviously will change america will not be the same after september 11 the world will not be the same what can be done and i remember when our chaplains met in uh, in uh, the office of um, our director then pastoral care was called then and said, what can we do at the same time when we were meeting as chaplains entertaining the ideas and the possibilities, we received a message from our president, Jack DeJoya, who said, what can guys do? And we decided together, working with the office of the president to have an interfaith service at Levy. Yeah. And we thought that the only way 
to start responding in a positive way. We are all in this together. Right. We are together for love. We are together for justice. We are together for understanding. We are together united against hate, against the prejudice, against racism. We are all in this together. And the best way to respond is to connect with our creator, with our divine. No one, and we, this was around 10.30 a.m. At 12.15 p.m., less than two hours later, hundreds of students, of faculty members, of staff, along with our president, were meeting in Levy to do an interfaith prayer. Everyone prayed from their heart, from their soul, from their mind. People were in tears, but people were hugging one another. People were engaging one another in a way I have never seen. And wow. I believe that what happened at Levy was the first interface service that have, was organized in America after September 11th. Mm. Wow. Less, less than a week later, I was asked if I would participate in interface service somewhere in Washington, DC. I said, no, we will do that at Georgetown University. And at Gaston Hall, we organized the first and largest interface service in the country. Wow. It bringing together hundreds. Gaston Hall was completely full. No place where you could even stand. We had re uh, uh, religious leaders from the Hindu tradition, the Buddhist tradition, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, every kind of faith where was represented on Gaston Hall stage. People were together, crying together, praying together, holding hands. Wow. What happened after that? So many interface services were organized in so many universities, in so many colleges, in so many cities across the country. The credit goes again to Georgetown University, to our values. When we say women and men for others, when we talk about interreligious engagement right. with full integrity, that's what, that's, that's what happened. But not only that, again, I was the, the Muslim chaplain at Georgetown University, a wonderful university, a respected university. My name was already known because the Washington Times and Washington Post and every major newspaper wrote an article about my hire just less than a year before. So my name was known. I was asked to go and meet with our administration at the White House responding to what became a, a anti-Muslim a, a sentiment in America. That Muslims are behind. Islam is against America. Of course, Islam has nothing to do with September 11 attacks. Uh, Islam did not propagate uh, the death of our fellow Americans in the World Trade Center. Uh, and there have been cases of attacks on Muslims uh, in the front of 7-Elevens, in malls, in the front of homes. And I told our president, Mr. President, Eisenhower, became the first U.S. sitting president to visit a mosque in the history of the country. Now it is you who can lead us as a nation, fully united against extremism and terrorism. He said, what do you suggest? I said, I suggest a, you visiting the Islamic Center that Eisenhower visited back in the 50s and make a statement to the nation that anti-Islam is anti-American. Mm -hmm. and that Muslims are a part of the fabric of the United States of America. In less than two days later, I was walking with the president, with a few other Muslim leaders, into that Islamic center. Wow. And he made his well-known statement how Americans are a part of the fabric of the United States. And any attack on American Muslims is an attack on the entire fabric. He set the tone for America. And for the country, for the nation, I have to give him the credit for that. But it is that message at the Islamic Center that empowered the U.S. Congress to do the same. Yeah. That afternoon, I was on the stairs of our U.S. Capitol with senators and congressmen and women doing the same appeal to America. Do not rush to judgment. American Muslims are a part of the fabric of America, and we are all in this together. So this is sort of... Uh, some memories of what happened on that wow. day, setting the tone that we are all in this together as a nation. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Imam. That's, I mean, it just shows you how
how important the university is uh, and, and really how blessed we were to have you um, here by that time. Um, you know, it's 21 years now um, of Muslim chaplaincy. So you're, you know, you know, you've, you've been, you, you've seen a lot and uh, you got a lot under your belt, but do you, do you think our, our Muslim uh, sisters and brothers uh, feel at home at this Catholic and Jesuit university? And is there any kind of way you could talk about how, how it matured over these years? Um, I don't know. You know, when, when I came to Georgetown university, uh, we our first Friday service that I organized uh, had 27 Muslim students. Wow! Uh, in the what was called the multi-purpose room in Copley. Okay. To discover after that that we needed a space for our own. Yeah. Which we had ended up having for so many years. Now we have uh, two Friday services held every week at Georgetown University, at the law school and at the main campus. Between both services, we get about 220 to 200 worshipers every week. Wow. That tells you about the increase and the interest and what happened in the growth of the Muslim community at Georgetown University. Uh, again, we had about 100 Muslim students. Now we have, I believe, close to 500 to 600 Muslim students in the law school, at the medical school, grad and undergrad we are fully a part of the university i remember a, a, a parent from pakistan telling him why from pakistan to washington dc to drop off your daughter he said imam we surveyed universities in europe in america and in the east the only place we felt we could leave our daughter and go home is georgetown university wow he said, why Georgetown? He said, because it's a religious university yeah. with well-established academic credit. Yeah. He said, but also having a Muslim chaplain makes it a plus. Yeah. But we also know that the priests care about her Muslim identity enough to make her feel at home. Imagine from Pakistan, they dropped her do their daughter and went back to their country. Yes, our students feel at home. I mean, the fact that a Muslim chaplain was hired. Yeah. The fact that we have a masjid, a, a mosque, if you will, at Georgetown University, the number of Muslims that has, has grown. The Center for Muslim and Christian Understanding. Yes. Makes Muslims feel at home. The Bridge Initiative, an initiative for, the, uh, for encountering Islamophobia in America, tells you. We have a Muslim prayer room at the law school. We have a Muslim prayer room at the medical school. Yes, we feel at home without any doubt, any shape, and in any 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 form. Yeah, that's it's amazing. I love always going to the uh, the to the the big dinner each semester or each fall, I guess, with the uh, Muslim Student Organization the Association. They always invite uh, me there, which is it's always quite lovely and. I, what I love about Georgetown too is that um, there really is a celebration of this diversity. It's not just toleration. It's not siloed. As you say, you're the most you're, you're the uh, imam for everyone. And I do, I, you know, that's the real thing. And, and as someone from the outside, just four years here now. I'm I'm in my senior year, you might say, in college. Um, I I do sense it, and um, and I love the fact that. When they celebrate, they invite others to celebrate with them and as well. So it's been really great, great to have that conversation with them around tables, around food. Yeah. Father Bosco, I have heard this so many times from parents who told me or sent me emails. Thank you, Imam. My, my child is better Catholic now, is better Protestant, is better Jew. Yeah. Uh, because they were afraid when their kids came to Georgetown University, what will happen to them? Right. To receive an email, Imam Hindi, it's my son has never been to a synagogue. Now he goes to synagogue, thanks be to you. That's what you did. Yeah. Or my child came to Georgetown. We forced her to go to Georgetown because it's Catholic, but she never prayed. Now she prays and goes to mass. Thanks for what you did. I had yeah. a specific student in mind now, without mentioning names, who was really debating her own religious identity mm -hmm. and working with her to introduce her to a different form of Catholicism. Her image of Catholicism was the public image of 
child abuse or things like that. I right. hope Catholicism from a different spiritual perspective that only the imam was able to do at Georgetown University. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Because you didn't have any, you know, you didn't have anything in the game there, so she could trust you and, uh, or he could trust you uh, to do that. You know, I do, I, I am very impressed with the way that the, the different interfaith um, chaplains are, are collaborators and really friends who accompany each other and their students, uh, especially. So that's really cool. Um, we have a little bit more time before going to questions, so I, I, we have to talk. We have to talk about the interfaith pilgrimage that uh, we did to the Holy Land um, last Christmas break. Uh, it actually, it was right before the pandemic hit. We were we were blessed on our timing because if we had done this at spring break, we would have never been able to do it. But um, you know, it was truly one of the most. I'm to be honest with you, I, I must say it was one of the most transformational moments in my life as an adult Jesuit. Um, the opportunity for you and for me and for Rabbi Rachel, really to take our faculty and staff um, and Council of Regents. We had, you know, as you remember, we had we had members of the Council of Regents to visit both Israel and Palestine. Wow, it was it was amazing. And I have to say, a lot of it was due to your good work of do, of you know having grown up there, but also of do, doing this work so much. So we got to meet so many people uh, engaged in peace with human rights. Um, people of prayer. We went into ancient mosques. We went to ancient synagogues. We went into um, the Catholic, you know, places of Bethlehem and the um, uh, and in Jerusalem. Um, so it was just really amazing. And, and I, I have to give you credit so that everybody knows how much of a how much you planned all this and made it happen for us. But um, I remember you saying that um, as we were we were all sitting around. I think it was you, and Rabbi Rachel, that only only Georgetown could have pulled this trip off. The way we did it um, with such conversation, and can you just explain what you meant? Uh, I think people, I think alums would really like to know how, why was Georgetown able to do, really do it this way. You know, again, I mean, Jesuit values. <laughs> you know, uh, learning about one another, honest, dignified, transparent, interreligious dialogue. At Georgetown, I say Georgetown is a, a, a university with a soul. Yeah. We are really colleagues. We are really friends. We are really sisters and brothers. I mean, we're in the country where you have a Catholic priest next to a Protestant Orthodox, next to a rabbi, next to an imam, next to a Hindu, all together. And we, we work with one another. So at Georgetown University, as I said, we teach together in the yeah. class. Yeah. We pray together. Uh, we respond to conflicts together. We create peace together. Whenever there's a disaster in the world, we come together to pray together. And people see us when yeah. there's good. We empower it together. We stand against racism on daily basis together. So we do that in the classroom. It's uh, our president, Jack DeJoya. I got. I have to give him the credit. He's yeah. on board everything we do. He's yeah. completely supportive. Yourself and those who were in leadership in your position before you came, Father Bosco. We're also on board supporting us morally and financially and institutionally that we need to do this together. So we did not need to do much of that work that you would need to do in other institutions because we are already colleagues and we have that level of a trust. Uh, uh, but also, uh, I have organized those trips twice before for our course, Interreligious Encounter, I have taken a priests and rabbis with the students in that case. It was mm -hmm. once in the year uh, 2000 uh, for the Jubilee year. And we were with John Paul II in Rome after mm -hmm. the Holy Land of, 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 of Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Nazareth and that wow. beautiful. Year. And we did another one in the year uh, 2009. We took our students to the Holy Land so we have done this. We have built the momentum, the interest, the credit. People know us on the ground. People know us at Georgetown University. That level of the trust is what we have done over time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to say that um, what I loved about our trip is that we had moments where we got to pray in a mosque together. As I mean, there were three Muslim, at least six Jewish, the rest kind of Catholic and Christian in our, in our trip. And uh, I just thought it was really profound that we we went to uh, you know uh, a Shabbat together, we went to uh, mosques together, we went to Catholic the Catholic Mass in Bethlehem together, and 
Um, and of course, I think my highlight was having mass um, on the uh, Lake of Galilee, um, right there outside uh, with, 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 with this community. And the conversation was so high level because you had all these academics who their whole lives were filled with this. I mean, if you, if you had a question, we could ask you, but we could also ask you know, somebody at another center or another center. We had a lot of the, those people. It was really quite profound. Um, and I and guess, it, please. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I want to say, but the most moving thing for me where it, it overwhelmed me was all of us doing the Stations of the Cross in Jerusalem together. Yes, and if you remember, as we were working on the itinerary, it was my idea that I want you to lead us in a mass at the yeah. Sea of Galilee. Yeah, it was, yes, I'm so glad you did, because it was so moving, oh my gosh. And maybe it, with my due respect, I mean, you said yes to it, but I, with, I don't think you even then knew the impact of that a specific experience on you and on others in the trip that we are praying together where Jesus prayed thousands of years ago. Yeah, yeah. To overlook that Sea of Galilee yeah. and the justice for peace, for understanding was very so empower, empowering. Even for me, another experience when we walk together into the Church of Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. Right. And go through that experience where Jesus was born. And you have Jewish, Christians, and Muslims who are very intellectual, very informed, very educated individuals, but yeah. connected with the divine in a different way, in a very spiritual way. That was amazing experience. Going through checkpoints together. Yeah, yeah. For Jewish, Christians, and Muslims to be on a bus waiting to go through a checkpoint yeah. Controlled by the military. Yeah. And see the difficulties, the daily difficulties of people on the ground was so powerful in every way, in every shape, and every form. So many of us were transformed. Yeah. We were much more a Georgetown family than one could 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 ever imagine. Yeah. I, I remember really feeling deep down that um by the halfway through the trip, uh that these were not my these were not my colleagues. These were my sisters and brothers. You know, uh, I really felt that in a profound way, a kind of uh, uh, just a closeness in that regard, not just a professional colleagueship. And uh, well, it was a great trip. We, of course, want to do it again. Of course, COVID is kind of, you know, stuck. We've got, we're stuck in this COVID moment, this pandemic. But I really do think it was a it was a way to kind of in, in, inspire. If we can bring students again, that'll be great. Um, Hopefully we can let's we have just a little bit more time with some questions and then we want, we want to go to the um, to those who are asking them. But you know I I want to thank you for raising helping us raise money to create that beautiful MSG uh, on campus. Um, can you just tell folks about this new space here, this place where we can worship now on the on the hilltop? Yeah, again, uh, Georgetown University is the only American institution of higher uh, knowledge that has a masjid that has a mosque. Again, the credit goes to Georgetown University and its values. It goes uh, to all of us, fully united to ensure that all students feel at home, able to connect with God, believing in that empowering not only the mind, but also the soul and the heart is important for our, our world. Uh, it was not easy uh, to call and travel to raise funds for it. And we raised almost uh, above a million dollars together from our alumni, our friends, our students to build this institution. We called it, we called, we gave it a name called Yaro Mahmoud Masjid. Mm -hmm. Yaro Mahmoud is an, a black Muslim who lived in Washington DC before the founding of America. Mm. And he was a banker. So we decided to call it after Yaro Mahmoud to tell America and Muslims and the world yeah. that African Americans are a part of the fabric of the United States of America. Yeah. Some of them were brought here as slaves, but they were never slaves. They cannot be slaves. I wanted to tell American Muslims that American Islam is not made by Muslims who came to America 30 or 40 years ago. American Islam has always been a part of America 
a part of North America and a part of the United States of America for hundreds of years. We are all in this together, whether we are white or black. So yeah. for me, that's quite an important name to speak about our united voice against racism and racists in America and all around the world. The Masjid Now capacity is about 90 people on Friday in the sanctuary. Uh, we have also a multi-purpose room. We call it Abu Hamid al-Ghazali Lecture Hall. It holds about 50 people for lectures, and we have done lectures before the pandemic. We have a halal kitchen uh, that we use to invite students and a faculty and staff to engage spiritually, but also uh, uh, intellectually and emotionally with yeah. the affairs of the community. We have our go areas, nothing like this anywhere in, in, in the country. Yeah, it's such a beautiful space, and I loved having dinner with uh, so many, so many of the alumni of Georgetown who uh, who helped, you know, uh, contribute. It was such a, a lovely, lovely lunch, and uh, that we we had to really to thank them for um, helping us with this project. But if if you get on anybody who's listening, you can get on campus. Um, it's just a it's an extraordinary space, and once COVID, once the pandemic is. <laughs> is over um we look forward to getting back in there as quick as possible which speaking of kind of the last question perhaps um how what are you doing uh in this time of pandemic to stay in touch with um with our muslim students alumni things like that uh, well we have our weekly zoom lecture on tuesdays uh, and we are calling it unlocking your potential and maximizing your performance Oh, Helping yeah. our students find ways to unlock their own potentials, and each student has his or her own potential, but maximize their performance in life using the Quran and the tradition of Islam to help them unlock their own potentials and leadership uh, skills. Uh, we started a series of lectures on racism and how do we work against racism and racists in the country and across the world, racism within and racism without the Muslim community. Uh, we also started uh, a, a monthly lecture called Alumni Career Lecture. Oh. We Georgetown Muslim alumni to come and talk about how Georgetown shaped their lives, spiritually and professionally. Nice. How to connect them with those who are still at Georgetown University. And this has been well attended monthly lecture of alumni who are now in the medical field, in the political field, in the legal world, who have become really, really, really successful. But also our Zoom meetings, my friend, <laughs> this is the new <laughs> pandemic. I call it the pandemic Zoom meetings. Yeah. I spend seven to nine hours a day, almost, almost, uh, on Zoom meetings, connecting with the students within our borders as a nation, but also internationally. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of work with even our students over in Qatar, you know, the Qatar campus. I remember you saying that and, and kids really being kind of grateful that they had a, 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 a way to get to, to speak with you on one-on-ones especially. Yeah, it, often I get calls. The last one was earlier today from the president of the MSA at Georgetown, Qatar, who wanted me to give them a lecture about self-care. Uh. Uh, in the spirit of uh, coronavirus and how the impact of coronavirus on them. So yes, I engage with our students in that regard as well. Every Friday, uh, I record uh, a video message from 10 to 15 minutes and send it out uh, for our community as well. Oh, wow. It's great. You know, there's been, it's, it's a lot of work to do, to do, um, all these Zoom meetings, but it is, it's keeping the connective tissue, I think, of, of Georgetown's uh, community together. And I really appreciate all that you do uh, for them. Um, I think we're going to go and, and look at some questions now. So I'm going to ask these questions uh, and we'll see how they go. So the first question that came in was, Imam, um, I remember you talking once about welcoming Muslim visitors to campus, and they were asking you about what do you do with all those crosses on the buildings at Georgetown? And was and how uh, that how that was important. Um, uh, can you talk about this experience? Do you remember what this person's talking about? Actually, this happened a few times. Okay. Uh, almost 20 years ago, there was a debate within the student community and some faculty 
about the presence of uh, crucifix in, in, in the classrooms. And I remember telling um, different officials of Georgetown from the president to vice presidents and staff and faculty that what they brought me to Georgetown is Georgetown religious Catholic identity. Mm. And the removal of the crucifix or the crosses from classrooms for me is a compromise on Georgetown Catholic Jesuit and religious identity. Yeah. I am there because of those values, because of those crosses, not despite of those crosses. Mm -hmm. And I said, if those crosses are removed, then Georgetown is compromising on its interest in religion and on spirituality and on God and on, on the integration of spirituality and intellectuality. Yeah. Therefore, I remember saying, if Georgetown removes those crucifix from the classrooms, I will resign right then and there. Mm, wow. I am there because of those that, uh, and what they represent. And I don't want any compromise by Georgetown on its Catholic and Jesuit and religious identity. It's that religious identity that it brings us together. The presence of those crucifix do not it forced me to compromise on who I am as as a Muslim. Actually, it makes me become better Muslim. Yeah, I think that was part wasn't that was part of the kind of the identity kind of wars of of the early two thousands. I think we I think the university has certainly moved past that as a kind of uh, argument. And we have obviously uh, crucifixes on the, on the walls here uh, today. But um, I do think that that was a kind of a moment for George Georgetown itself to kind of have a reflective moment. Uh, about its own identity and what its values are, and, and what are those symbols that remind us of those values. So, excellent. I that uh, uh, someone who identified himself as a secular Catholic, a sacred Catholic. he was surprised to hear that from me. Oh, and very good. If an imam wants the crucifix to stay, then I want them to stay too. Great, great. That's wonderful. Um, another question is coming in about just about radicalization that happens in all the uh, faith traditions, including Islam. And um, what do you what do you sense as imam what Georgetown tries to do to educate and inform students about the differences uh, between faith uh, and the kind of radicalisms that kind of are engendered by media and by um, uh, and, and and by real groups. Uh, trying to vie for the attention of people. You know, you fear that which you do not know. You fear that which you do not know. Uh, radicalism on all sides is uh, shared by so many factors, including ignorance. Yeah. So an institution like Georgetown University is an academic institution. It's an intellectual institution. It's an, in an institution that uh, in enhances uh, uh, the role of the mind and finding information and questioning information. Mm -hmm. So I see Georgetown University and any academic institution as a place where we would fight uh, and encounter religious extremism or political extremism in the best form. Uh, 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 at Georgetown University, we ask questions of religion. We ask questions about why and how and what. Right. Uh, questions of the historical legacy of religions. We ask the questions about what can move us forward. So the presence of information is for me the way to move forward and that's how we can fight radicalism. Yeah, I think, you know, and also what I love about, you know, the, we, mostly it's about, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, right? It's our, it's our undergrads who are trying to understand who they are and, and being able to walk with them too. Um, and, and, and try to answer some of those misconceptions, but also really walking with them and say, what are you really talking about? What are you really afraid of? Or um, have you ever really spoken to, have you been to a Shabbat? Have you been to a, you know, one of the, one of the most moving experiences of my very first year here was when there was some anti-Semitic remarks uh, that were sketched on, uh, on a wall. And the Jewish community was very, very upset. And I remember that everybody came to the Friday Shabbat, and I think including you and, and some, some of the a Muslim Student Association. And I was so moved by the fact that um, when Rabbi Rachel said, well, we, know, we have so many constituents here in this room, um, could you please just say who you are? And I think it was one group said, you know, it was the Protestant, maybe who says, you know, and we have your back. And, and then the Muslim Student Association stood up and said, we have your back. It was a real sense of, wow, 
We are going to be Georgetown first. We're going to, we might have to struggle with these things, but we are doing this together and we're going to accompany each other and this kind of stuff. It was, again, I don't think I had been here even a few weeks when it happened. Profound, profound sense that I'm in a very unique university uh, working here. I know so many <laughs> diplomats who have told me and sent me emails, Imam Hindi, thank you for what you have told me and taught me in the four years I spent at Georgetown. Now I am a better diplomat because you engaged me with Islam in a positive way. You engaged me with, with the Muslim world, with the right authentic information about the Muslim world. Yeah. I've seen students who come from small conservative Christian uh, uh, households, and they grew up hating Islam, hating Muslims because of what they see on TV. Right, right. Afraid of connecting with their fellow neighbors. And, and have undermined their own professionalism because of that. But at Georgetown University, seeing me, talking to me, engaging me, coming to the Muslim service and seeing Islam for what Islam really is, engaging and opening the door of dialogue with the Muslim colleagues, help them become better at who they are. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's a real thing. And I, I, you know, the alumni have so much to be proud of. The, the work that has been done here and uh, and how Georgetown is a conduit really for for future leaders in interfaith work, both in the academic intellectual world, uh, but in the world of just uh, living in, in, in respect for, for one another. Um, I, I remember in again in that course in the religious encounter in 2003, I had two students, one Muslim and one Jewish. <laughs> And when they introduced themselves at the beginning of the class, they decided to each sit on the opposite side of the classroom because they both grew up thinking that the other side is an enemy. Yeah. And believe me, they would come in from both doors. They would make <laughs> sure that they don't sit next to one another or across to one another. Yeah. And the course progressed. I saw this coming together, coming together, coming together. Wow. When we, we used to do an oral exam, beside the written exam uh -huh. so shocking that both of them decided to do the oral exam together wow and to have me and rabbi white them examine them and after they graduated they did a one-year trip across the world together a jew and a muslim so both of them came in with radical hatred against the other right. graduated with real Friendship. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's a great anecdote. A great story to remember. Um, you know, uh, we had a question about: um, Can you talk about the Majus immersion trips that you've done with students as an alternative spring break in previous years? So this must have been at somebody who was was a, had done that before with you. Yes. It, it, this is an amazing. You know, again, a few years ago, uh, as Islamo. Islamophobia was becoming very negatively uh, uh, divisive uh, and um, deadly in America and destructive for our nation and for the country. We thought that the best way to fight Islamophobia and hatred is to have people engage with Islamophobia and the impact of Islamophobia on the, on the ground. So we called our trip uh, Deconstructing Islamophobia. And for a full week, we invite our students to travel to New York, to Philadelphia, to Baltimore, and here in our nation's capital, to engage with academics, with religious leaders, with activists, and with institutions that work on the issue of Islamophobia, to engage with law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. And it became so powerful experience that at the end of the week, our students developed tools of how you fight hatred against anyone and everyone yeah. of how you discover that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere that islamophobia is not only a hatred of islam it is one of so many uh, forms of hatred and bigotry that exist in our country and racism that we have to fight together no one should be rejected and hated on the ground of their religious background or a, a, a ethnicity or tribe or language we're all in this together yeah yeah no it's been it's been a really a powerful experience and of course we do one on anti-semitism as well 
Um, and so there's a real sense that there's, there's students really engaging their spring break. I mean, I think it's really wonderful that they engage their spring break for these kinds of things. Um, I think we have time for many students who think that, I mean, non-Muslim students in this case, who think that American Muslims are a, a 100, 200,000 people who came to America a few, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Go to New York and say that Islam came to New York hundreds of years ago. Right. To right. see actual masjids that have been in New York for almost 80 years and 90 years. Yeah. It was very surprising to so many of our fellow American students. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember someone saying that there's like you know, a plaque or something that says that this is where one of the first Muslims or something, you know, uh, back before there was a, a nation, you know. Uh, so there is a sense that we, we have a very selective kind of uh, histories that we have uh, told ourselves, and it was really good to kind of deconstruct that. There's a question um, about, it says, thanking us for this, but it says, Imam, um, I'm, I'm familiar with the jihad promoting portions of the Quran, but I would love to have you point out the peace-seeking and ecumenical uh, respects of those portions um, that are that are there. Can you just mention the fact that that in many ways, uh, jihad is a kind of a word that's uh, it's fraught in the world, but it actually does have um, a, mo a, pl a place for peace, I think it's what they're saying. Uh, um, actually, uh, the concept of jihad is very misunderstood uh, by Muslims and, and non-Muslims. Okay. It's the most abused term mm -hmm. in religious settings. The word jihad means to strive to do good. Mm. Very much in Judaism, like the concept of tikkun ulam, that you strive to create a better world that is constructively positive and helpful. Christianity had the concept of jihad, that you strive for the doing of good in the society. Hinduism had the concept of jihad, we strive to do good. So jihad is a form of striving to do good in the society. What we are doing now, now, in religious terminology is jihad. We are spending time and energy to learn from one another, that's jihad. Taking food to your neighbor is a form of jihad. A teaching in a classroom, Georgetown University is an operation of jihad mm. because it strives in mind, in heart, and in, in, in spirit to, to, to bring about good to the world. When, we, when you take care of your cat, that's jihad. When you take care of your father and mother, that's jihad. When you feed the hungry, that is jihad. So jihad is not holy war. Actually, if I may be historically accurate, the concept of holy war was invented historically by Pope uh, uh, Urban II when he wanted to wage a holy, what he called a holy war against the Mohammedans. Right. The concept of holy war does not exist. In the Quran, there's no concept of harb muqaddasa, holy war. War is not holy, cannot be holy in any way, in any shape and any form. So yeah. with my due respect to my Catholic friends here, as Urban II abused his own scripture to yeah. wage war against not only Muslims, he waged a war against the Christians too. The Orthodox Christians for sure. And Muslims too. So, yeah. did, so do the Muslims. When, you, when they give the word jihad a bad meaning of holy war, war cannot be holy. One of the attributes of God in Islam is as salam, the source of peace. After every prayer, we say, Ya salam, anta salam, O oh God, the source of peace, you are the one of peace. Greet us with peace. The word Islam comes from the word salam, which means peace. Yeah. Islam is named after a definition, and that is peace. In order to be saved in the life to come, the day of judgment in Islam is called Darus Salam, the abode of peace. In order to abide in peace, in the abode of peace in the life to come, you have to live the life of peace on earth. So that's that, the it's four o'clock. On that note, we have to we have to end our conversation, uh, uh, Yaya. Um, but it's good we can end on this hope for peace, the striving for peace, the way that uh, Georgetown has tried to create uh, students to be really women and men for others in our in our Ignatian language, but really people that are peacemakers uh, around the world. 
Thank you so much, uh, Imam. I have to say, it's been really nice to see you. It's been a long time that we've not been able to be together, you know, in the flesh. So it's good to see you on this. Um, I want to also tell everyone, thank you for joining us. And we're going to be doing a, um, another um, one of these conversations with Father Bosco with uh, our um, Vice President Todd Olson on November 24th, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, a man just talking about his Ignatian journey. Uh, and his work at Georgetown University. So, so join us on that uh, as well. You'll get more, um, obviously, invitations for that. In the meantime, everybody really have a very good, peaceful day, especially as we are still working out this election. Let's have a peaceful week. Uh, and um, and uh, thank you again, uh, Imam, for, for being with us. Thank you, Father, and thank you all for allowing me to engage you. And you're very welcome to email me, to text me, to call me if I can be of more help. Meanwhile, please be safe. Take care of yourself. We are all in this together and we shall overcome. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Ciao. Bye now.